Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit of the Wild Podcast, Blue Please on CynicalBrit.com, and welcome back to Tol Barad. This is the second of two videos about this new PvP zone. I promised you a slightly longer battle, and that's exactly what you're going to get. Sadly, it's Horde favored, oddly enough. I did this at, well, what you can see there in the time under the minimap is 4.13. That's not actually correct. Bear in mind, all of the servers are based in the US, including the European ones. This wasn't all that early in the morning. It was about 10, 11 o'clock. But regardless, the Alliance didn't seem to show up for this. But there are a few, and it gives me a good chance to talk a little bit more about Tolbarad in greater detail than the last video that was a little bit short in terms of the actual fighting. Now, the mechanics of this should now be familiar to you. You've got the three points there, and you've also got the three towers. Blow up the towers to get extra time if you are the attackers. Defend the towers if you are the defenders to ensure that you are able to run out the clock. Capture all three buildings, and you will take control of Tolbarad in beta. Currently, that is for 60 minutes only, at which point there will be a new fight. I don't know whether or not it'll actually reach the live stage like that. I am not convinced that it will, because there is another VOA-style raid instance, and it seems to be awfully silly to only make that raid available for 60 minutes at a time. There may be another system in place to allow that to maintain for longer. I really don't know. The nice thing about the length of this particular battle is it gives me plenty of time to talk about the zone in terms of my actual opinion, analyze whether or not it's any good and show you how the ebb and flow of the battle actually works. Try and extrapolate that flow a little bit to predict how a larger battle would work in a live environment. So, my first impression of this is I'm glad that they've reduced the amount of siege warfare that's going on. Wintergrasp had its place, but honestly when it comes to PvP, I'd rather PvP as my own character and not as some awkward slow tank thing. I think vehicles have evolved quite a bit, honestly, and in the starting zones, particularly in Cataclysm, they perform much better than they do in Wrath of the Lich King. Indeed, I even enjoy the Strand of the Ancients Battleground. I think it's pretty neat. I don't think it's a particularly good competitive battleground. It's not all that well balanced, and it's really not geared towards actual high-end PvP play, but bear in mind that most of the battlegrounds aren't. High-end PvP tends to occur in arenas where it's more about the actual skill ceiling and class composition as opposed to how many dudes you can, say, dogpile that alliance with. Needless to say, this video contains quite a bit of dogpiling alliance. We do outnumber them quite a lot here. So yeah, the only use of those siege engines really is to bring down the spires. So you're going to have to get into one. You can find them scattered around the place. They can be blown up. So in a larger, say, I don't know, maybe 40 v 40, we'll just make a blind assumption of what it's actually going to be. Everything could possibly change in beta. So we have no idea. But say in a 40 v 40 uh, with a bunch of level 85s, blowing up those siege engines wouldn't be all that hard to do in a group. So you could have a few guys running around blowing up the siege engines they do respawn, but it does take a little bit of time for that to happen, and there aren't all that many on the map. I do have to wonder whether or not that will scale with the number of people that are actually in the zone. It is a possibility. Vehicle denial was a key strategy in Winter Grasp, whereby you deny your opponent the ability to spawn siege vehicles, which also denies them the most reliable way of blowing their way through your walls. In this case, you don't have to take any points to make that happen. You just have to find the vehicle and render it beyond use, let's just say, before an alliance manages to jump into it and run off. Now, in terms of the actual capture mechanics, you can see the bar down there, it's fairly similar to a lot of different capture objectives, whether they be in world PvP or in actual battlegrounds. I must say, I do prefer capture the flag style scenarios as opposed to stand on the point dunk off scenarios. There are places and games in which that works fairly well. Team Fortress 2, Battlefield games, for instance. In WoW, it's just not all that entertaining. It's standing around and doing nothing. The worst thing is that you can actually be delayed by an alliance that is in the area, since the capture point is fairly large. You won't be able to see that alliance and just got to go and look around. It's pretty irritating. I assume that you cannot capture while in stealth, so it's not too bad, but still, it does involve sitting there and doing nothing. That said, bear in mind that my interpretation here is from a 
sparsely populated beta version of this particular PvP area. Now, I've designated myself Scout here, so I'm looking at the various towers to see if there's anyone there and getting aggressive. And it's like, okay, let's do it. Let's make this happen. I engage a Warlock, a level 83 Warlock. Probably not the best of ideas. God, she's taking no damage whatsoever. Thankfully, she's a terrible shot with all of that stuff. And I have a friend. It's okay. A fellow troll is here to save me from... Yeah. So the Fraps footage actually cut out there, I assume because the brutality was too much for it to handle. So I've created an artistic interpretation of what actually happened to that gnome warlock. Okay, so maybe artistic might have been overstretching reality just a little bit. Some people might say, well, Total Biscuit is afraid to show his ass getting handed to him in PvP. Hell no, there's plenty of that, both in the last video and in this one. It's entertaining. Ah, is that another one of those warlocks? Yes, it is. Thankfully, I have friends. It's okay. Yeah, you're not going to see any mad PvP skills here, mostly because, well... We outnumber them like five to one, but what you will see is me exploding in fire, which is extremely entertaining. I can't say for sure as to whether or not this is going to be any kind of valid high-end PvP spec. I would suspect not. I mean, fire's always been okay for battlegrounds. The thing is, anything's been okay for battlegrounds, really. It's not that hard to make any odd PvP spec work when you're standing 40 yards away from the target and five of your guys are jumping him at every possible opportunity. But so much fire and flame and smoke and explosions. Oh, this is why I spec fire to begin with. I used to be spec fire in Molten Core, by the way. You want to know how much of a pain in the ass that was? Spec Frost, Total Biscuit. No, Frost is for sissies. I eventually did spec Frost because it was optimum at the time. But really, I was so very glad when I finally got into an instance that I was able to use fire properly in, i.e. Anchorage. Thankfully, Blackwing Lair had some mobs that were not immune to fire, but hey, there you go. Now, I was trying to figure out as to whether or not I'd actually fix my squad and combat text here. I think this has got to be a beta bug, unless I'm being incredibly dumb, and I'm sure one of you will point that out if that's the case. Uh, stuns, impact, wonderful, wonderful movement. Aiming that is a little tricky, but you do get used to it after a while. You see, this is how you PvP. You hide in a bush, and you throw three-second casts at them. Or in this case, with the amount of haste I've got on this character, it's actually more like 2.1. But there you go. Now, let's talk about the way that this is actually designed, and whether or not this is going to be any fun to play. You don't really get a fair look at it by watching an uneven beta fight where it's not capped out. This is going to be a problem for a while, what beta testers choose to test is entirely up to them. They don't have to go into Tolbarad, and also bear in mind that there's only a very limited window in which they can do so to begin with. Once the battle's over, they've got to wait an hour before another one begins. It might simply not be convenient. <laughs> oh, you, that's unique. You've never seen that before. I'm sorry. I'm chasing after a siege engine while casting Scorch. You may also notice, although the sound is a little low for obvious reasons, that there are some new fire sound effects. I don't know if I like them. I love the original one. I like this the little ember snapping noise of conjuring a fireball or a pyroblast and hurling it at the enemy. These are a bit more high fidelity, but they just don't have that nostalgia factor. Now, if Tangent Biscuit can get back on topic for just a second, the actual design of the area... I don't know. I, I think it's going to have some real issues. You're talking about a three-point defense map whereby you have a large space in between the three points in question. So are you going to get any decent PvP battles in the middle? I'm thinking no, honestly. The way the keep in the middle is actually set out for the defenders, there is no way for the attackers to access it. You've got to actually slow fall off of there. So you could land really anywhere. It seems impractical to try and box people in there, particularly when there's going to be so many folks all over the place in terms of this map. Are there going to be any flashpoints in the marsh area? Well, 
I don't know, really. It seems large enough and lacks choke points, so I don't really see that happening. The fights are going to be happening here and at the other two capturable locations, as well as at the actual towers themselves. I think, perhaps more so than in other PvP scenarios, this is the kind of place where a fixed team is going to sway the way that the battle actually goes, whether it be a full raid or just a few people. When you've got six different areas to defend, you've got to spread out and you've got to try and ensure that your resources are allocated appropriately. You've also got to make sure that you're not spread too thin, a la, say, a Rathi Basin, whereby if you put all your eggs in one basket and you defend one point, then what ends up happening is the other team takes the other four and you lose. In this case, they've got to take all three of those areas but you've also got to look at the possibility of losing your towers and if you lose your towers that gives the attackers extra time quite a significant amount of extra time as well that said there is an argument really against going for the towers a little bit too much i don't know how long it really takes to knock them down but i saw a single tank wailing away on one and it took Quite a while, honestly. It's not something that I can see going down all that fast. So you're going to have to dedicate at least a few guys in siege engines to get there. What you also want to do is ensure that your siege engines are properly escorted, because if they're not, then they're going to be easy pickings for the defenders. They have 400,000 health, which seems like a lot now, but at level 85, that's not really going to be the case. They may scale with gear. I am unsure at this point. I know that was happening in winter grasp a bit after some of the more recent patches so it might be the case here too but bear in mind those siege engines don't have any defensive weapons as far as i can tell they turn very slowly they don't have any kind of speed boost as far as i can tell again i've not been in one the two battles that i've done i've been on the defending side both times but from what I've seen of the siege engines in action and how they attack, it doesn't really seem like they could fend off a mobile attacking force. They would just get destroyed and then, of course, you're down one siege engine and you've got to wait for it to respawn. Is it worth it to dedicate a significant force to a tower? Maybe, arguably. I mean, you are talking about a 30-minute match, but then again, you're also talking about a 30-minute match which should have a bare minimum of 40 versus 40 in it. Those three points are going to be well defended. Depending on the strategy of the defending players, what you could end up finding is you take two points and then suddenly you run into a brick wall. And it's entirely feasible, honestly. If I take my entire 40-man defense team and sit on the last point, what exactly are they going to do about it? Are they really going to try and run in there? If I can organize myself as a proper defensive team, move my guys around, you're going to throw yourselves into a choke point and die. When you think about it, the concept is really quite similar to Wintergrasp in terms of the philosophy behind it, not in terms of how it actually plays. It's Siege and Sally Forth style gameplay. The attackers are having to siege various areas on the map. In this case, they're sieging these points right here that they have to capture as opposed to the walls of the Wintergrasp Fortress, which they then have to break into and smash down the gate with siege engines. And the defenders are really forced to sally forth and try and stop the attackers from doing that taking back the points that they lost destroying the siege vehicles to ensure that their towers don't go down but i'm not really convinced that it's as essential here as it is in say winter grasp in winter grasp you can reach a point where you have a critical mass of enemy siege engines so say the attackers on winter grasp have all of the siege workshops they're able to pump out a huge number of vehicles they can keep doing so almost ad infinitum and they will eventually wear down the defenders and if you concentrate all of your siege engines at a single point the defenders aren't going to be able to dps them down fast enough they'll eventually kill the door and then that's that in this case that kind of attrition really doesn't apply in the same way you're throwing players at players you're not throwing vastly more powerful siege engines at players and indeed at destroyable walls and towers that are part of the objective itself that said bear in mind that the only spawn point for the defenders is actually in the middle of the map so theoretically if you were able to get a good enough attack and get a few initial casualties, you would hopefully be able to grind the defenders down and take the point before they were able to get back there. 
I'm not convinced, however. You know where that graveyard is right there that we just passed. There are a number of graveyards here that they could spawn in, and some of them are actually quite close to the points in question. Number of places they could come from. Reinforcements for the attackers do seem to be in more convenient locations than those for the defenders, but since there are multiple graveyards, I should also point out that they may be spread out. And without proper organization, they'd be unable to concentrate their forces in any one specific location. I didn't honestly get enough playtime here to really judge whether or not these respawn mechanics in this area actually work. In theory, I think they might, but I could just see a large-scale battle becoming a massive war of attrition centered around one particular point. Really because once two points are taken, the safest bet seems to be to sit on the third one and defend it for all it's worth and run the clock out. I think about it for a second, why would you even bother to go out and take back the other points when there aren't any real benefits to doing so? You don't get any buffs, you don't get anything like that, you don't get access to siege engines, and you certainly don't stop the opponents from getting siege engines. Capturing one of these things doesn't extend your time, only destroying the towers does. So in reality, if the attackers have two out of three, why would you not just take 40 people, arrange them in a defensive formation, and say, come and get it? Seriously, run into this choke point, see what freaking happens. It's obvious what's going to happen. They're going to die, repeatedly. A horrible, terrible, and merciless death. That's my argument on that in any case. This is based on the understanding that I have of the mechanics, which is, of course, based on my beta testing. There is no documentation for this place. And, oh god, it looks like an own warlock's back for seconds, and she's caught me completely off guard. I'm so very boned. Oh man, look at the HP. I'd love to show you how much damage I'm doing, but again, there is a bug in the beta, which means I can't display it. Oh, it's cauterized! That doesn't help when I'm still being nuked. Uh, GG. She gets her vengeance, and rightfully so. Well, could have been worse. Could have respawned at 30 seconds. Perhaps the delays might make it a viable strategy to try and break down a heavy defense of one of those places. To be honest, that's the only viable strategy. Once you get to that point, what else are you going to do? You've blown up the spires, you've got two out of three, you're going to have to throw yourself at that one remaining point, and you're just going to have to zerg, zerg, zerg. I don't know if that's actually going to be all that entertaining. I have to wonder about those tunnels that we saw in the previous touring video and whether or not they'll actually be used for anything. Right now, they don't seem to be. But if there were a way to come up under it and force the defenders to actually defend the tunnels as well, then that might make things a little better. At the moment, though, I'm envisioning these Wall of Death scenarios in the maxed out version of Tol Barad whereby you just have massive battle lines of people kicking the snot out of each other, respawning and getting back there. While the attackers might be able to get back to the battle line slightly faster, I'm not convinced that that's enough to overwhelm the pre-prepared advantage of the defenders. At least there are no big siege cannons in the three capturable points. There did seem to be some at the towers, so you can use those to knock out the siege engines if need be. But the capturable points themselves, no. No cannons, nothing like that. So no weapons of mass destruction there. You're going to simply have to rely on massed firepower from the defenders. Now you can see here I've headed into one of these places. It's really odd, isn't it? I mean, it looks like some kind of audience chamber or library, but there's just nothing there. It may have something to do with the raid instance, but it seems unlikely. It just, it doesn't look right. It's not the same map, for instance, that the raid instance actually has. It doesn't seem to have any relation to it. And I would think the raid instance portal is going to be in the keep in the middle. I mean, where else would it be? It makes sense. That's where the one for VOA was. So yeah, it's still a mystery as to what these tunnels are actually for. Perhaps they're incomplete, and maybe that's another feature that is going to be implemented at some point in the not-too-distant future. Blizzard, would you like to tell me exactly what they are? Because I can't figure it out. Absolutely not. Oh, wow. Some of my Geordie accents coming through there. You can tell I'm pretty tired. It's actually 1.15 a.m. as I finish off this video. So here's the critical question, I guess, about Tol Baran. Is it any fun? Well, it's a nice map. 
I'll start off with that. I like the way that the map's designed. I like the actual aesthetic of it. I think it's very neat. I like the fact that there are six potential flashpoints. I think that's kind of cool. And I also like the fact that we spawn in the middle and have really ready access to go wherever we please if we happen to be the defenders. As regards to whether or not it's any fun, well, I was part of the old South Shore versus Tavern Mill Wars back at the start of the game, and I found that large-scale PvP to be enjoyable, even if there was no practical purpose to it. When the two battlegrounds came out, that was Alterat Valley and Warsong Gulch. I actually found that I preferred the Warsong Gulch, which was odd, really. I thought the large-scale PvP was really cool. It's like, hey, it feels like you're in a war. That's neat. I mean, why wouldn't it be? That's fun. It's entertaining. But honestly, it just didn't do it for me. I mean, Alterac Valley was so large and so complex at the time. And with the bunch of PvE stuff that was in there, I didn't really find myself enjoying it all that much. Oh god, I just got killed by Cauterize. At least I think I did. <laughs> Cauterize is interesting. It really is. It's something that you could probably save yourself with, say, an ice block. That's something that is not on my bars. People will no doubt point that out. That's fine. I'm doing testing. I don't really care. This is not my optimal PvP setup. And indeed, I'm going to have to figure out what that's going to be. Cataclysm has changed the way that Mage Fire PvP works significantly. And a lot of the spells have been altered. I mean, Mage Ward, for instance, is something you might actually want to use now. So... I think there's going to be a lot of reshuffling in terms of the skills that I use and the spells that are on my bars and where they actually are on my bars, as well as my damage rotation. And that, of course, affects the hotkeys themselves. It's not exactly optimal to have a damage rotation that involves you doing keyboard dancing as opposed to pressing keys that are close to each other. Some people might be confused by my hotkeys, by the way. I use a Logitech G11 and I also use a Razer Naga, so my hotkeys are not going to look all that normal. But when you've got a thumb pad, which has 12 buttons ready access, and then you also have 18 bindable macro hotkeys to your left, just past your left shift, then you tend to rethink the way that your key bindings actually work. But again, is it any fun? Large-scale PvP is not necessarily a highly skilled operation. It can be. There are scenarios where it has been proven to be. I remember actually back in BlizzCon 2005, they actually broadcast some battlegrounds. It was the one and only time that I've seen it done in a semi-competitive scenario. And I thought, this could work, actually. Maybe not in Alterat Valley, because that's silly, but Warsung Gulch and Arathi Basin that they were showing right there, yeah, they could be cast. They could be broadcast as sort of a semi-esport. They could be competitive. Could something like this be competitive, though? No, it's, it's too zergy. There's too many people. It involves running backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And you can win or lose entirely dependent on where the Zerg is at any given time. Controlling players in a public group like this, of this size, you can already see there's... Well, how many have we got there? This, that's the new UI, by the way. It's not a mod. There are no add-ons in Cataclysm. I do keep having to repeat that, but hey, there you go. So right now, we've got a block of, what, 8 times 4 That's fairly significant in terms of size, and apparently there can be a lot more. Convincing puppy players to go where you want them to go is akin to herding kittens. You sort of wave your arms around in the vague direction and hope that they don't either kill each other or end up falling down some kind of well that was inconveniently placed in your kitchen. Incidentally, if you do have a lot of kittens, I wouldn't recommend having a well installed in your kitchen. It does tend to end in disaster. It's from personal experience, trust me. If you take an organized team, however, you can do exactly the sort of thing you were able to do in Wintergrass, which was Spec Ops. You take a group of five or so, you make sure to avoid the main battle lines, you go and take out a vulnerable workshop or a vulnerable tower, and you can really change the ebb and flow of the battle. On the attacker's side, you're looking at going for something that's not the main front. So say you've got all of your defenders are concentrated in one place, and maybe there's something else you can capture, then you can go capture it. But it's not as beneficial as it would be in, say, Wintergrass, because it doesn't give you any direct benefit. Even though you need all three buildings, and it's obvious that, hey, having this building is beneficial, it's not a direct benefit. It doesn't help your cause. Indeed, arguably, it actually hinders it, because it can cause the defenders to clump up and really batten down the hatches and say, we're defending this one point, you ain't getting anywhere bloody near it. There's 40 of us in a battle line saying you aren't, so good luck. 
you can go for the towers, but once they're down, that's it, really. It's a bonus, but it's not going to win you the actual battleground itself. It's just going to extend the opportunities that you have to win. In the case of the defenders, you have to wonder to yourself, well, is it worth sending five guys off of my defensive line to go and retake one of those two vulnerable points? Because all of the Alliance are attacking us head on right here, and they can't really be defending those areas too much. So maybe I can take one back and spread it around. So on the defense, I think it matters a little bit more. You could probably hold the line minus five, whereas if you are the attackers, I mean, what are you really going to do? Once you have two out of three, what use is a spec ops group? Simple answer, there isn't one. In the case of Windergrasp, there was always a use for spec ops style groups on the defender side of things, because you had to take back those workshops. If you didn't, and you just left those guys to their own devices, then they were going to grind you into paste. You can't defend against that many siege vehicles constantly coming at you. It just can't happen. You don't have the firepower to do so. In this case, though, since siege vehicles don't become a factor, I just think that there's going to be that massive great choke point scenario and that it may end up in a stalemate at that point. We'll see how it goes, and I will keep you updated as to any changes to Tolbarad, and if I do manage to get into a 40 versus 40, I can show you that as well. My name's been Total Biscuit. Hopefully you've enjoyed this look at Tolbarad. Overall, fairly entertaining, but I'm just concerned that there might be some issues in the way that it plays at full capacity based on what I've just said right there. Oh, my name's been Tall Biscuit. You've been watching Tall Barad. I am going to bed. Yes, good night. I will see you tomorrow with yet more Cataclysm content.